E.M. Hotel. E.M. Hotel. Uh, before I start, I'd like to ask permission for my elders who are here. Speak. Start, my brother. Thank you, brother. Speak. Um, I'm going to pass something around. This is the sacred blue lotus. This is what was taken by the ancients before they entered the temple. Mm -hmm. it, the idea was to alter your consciousness so that all the outside world will be left outside and you were ready to join the ancestors that exist within you. Jeez. And so your consciousness rose. Mm. That was the reason for the incense and, and the sacred oils and stuff. And so we get ready to take a magical journey. I just want you to take a bit and roll it on your wrist and rub your wrist together. Because it's going to be, every once in a while when I go in real deep, I'm going to say take a sniff. <laughs> <laughs> rub it on your wrist and pass it around. Okay. You know how hard he's going to put it on you. <laughs> okay. Em Hotep, Uncle Uja Seneb Neb. We are divine spiritual beings having a divine human experience. And most of us leave the word divine out. We have to regroup. <coughs> Brother Cabo began to break down who we really are. Some of us don't even know it. Even those of us who are African historians, even those of us who think we're up on it, we don't really know who we are. Look at We are the essence of the cosmic universe. We are the black plasmic matter that exists, exists within our blood. Your blood is liquid crystal. You are a dynamic human being capable of things beyond your comprehension. When they look at the smallest particle in the universe, a quark, it appears and vanishes, appears and vanishes. And it vanishes and appears based upon the observer to let you know that the creator is observing itself through you. Teach. That's how powerful you are. Mm. And we're ready at this time, 2012, we were talking with uh, Reverend Clemson and he was saying we have to pay attention to this number. Because so many people have made reference to it. But brothers and sisters, 2012 is here now. You can see things happening. The magnetic poles are changing and shifting. You see volcanoes, tsunamis. You see earthquakes. You see things moving at an accelerated rate. The weather's going crazy. Things are happening. Some of this is not just based on the Wazungu, the European Caucasians who are trying to survive in the 21st century when their time is up. A lot of this is mother nature, mother father nature regrouping itself for the next millennium. Put it for on. this Aquarian age. And so brothers and sisters, you need to be prepared. Don't get caught with your pants down. You heard Brother Kava saying, a lot of y'all showing your pants because your elders show their pants. Pull your pants up because if your pants is down, you ain't gonna be able to get away. Be prepared for the worst. If it doesn't happen, then you are just sitting free. But if it does, you are prepared. Get to a place where you can go at least 90 feet above sea level. Make sure you can get there with your family and have supplies of water and food. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Because things are ready. Start pre preparing yourself with silver and gold and copper. Because you're going to have to barter for things. Food. Remember, we built the pyramids with no money. Okay. The greatest human resource, economic resource you have is your spirit, your human energy. And collectively, we represent an infinite reservoir of richness. And so we have to begin to uh, harness that energy so that you can be able to use it when time is necessary. Magical Kemet, you noticed uh, me and Professor Small were talking one day, and he was saying, you know, as we travel all around the world, everybody's fascinated with ancient Kemet, which we call Egypt today, but nobody's more fascinated with it than Africans in America. Come on. Africans on the continent are not that fascinated about Kemet. They've almost been programmed that this is somebody else. But Africans in America, we know this is us. And so me and Professor Small, were, we were building. And as we began to analyze African movement on the continent, 
we noticed that around the time that Africans were kidnapped from the continent and brought to the Caribbeans and dispersed throughout the diaspora to America, that that was the same time that we had this invasion of Eastern Africa. And these Africans had to flight for their life. We know that some of our chiefs and generals in their indigenous cultures sold some of our people, bartered our people off. But they didn't barter necessarily the people in their immediate village. What they did is they went out and got people who were just migrating, who were just passing through, who were just coming. We were coming from the valley, coming from the Hopi Valley. We got caught in this transatlantic trade, slave trade. And so many of the Africans that are dispersed throughout the diaspora are people of African descent who actually come from the Hopi Valley. And so we got the Neturu in our blood. We are the Neturu. I have conversations with people. They don't know the Madu Neturu, but they can feel it. They identify with the Neturu. They have dreams that they were the divine beings in other lifetimes. Your sister raising her hand. Amen. I get to testify a witness. A lot of us feel that. And we have young brothers, hip hoppers and stuff. They got all these symbols tattooed on their body. They don't even know what it means. But they got the onks and wings of Ma'at all tattooed all over them because they feel this energy. We are these divine beings, the greatest civilization in the modern world. And I say the modern world is anything after 10,000 uh, 10, years ago, the last ice age. The last ice age put an end to several golden ages that existed on the planet Earth. Planet Earth goes through these cycles. Uh, Brother Kaba broke down, for example, in the pyramid text, they talk about how they have been taught plotting three sun years. A sun year is approximately 26,000 years, the whole procession of the equinox. And so if we plotted three sun years, more than 75,000 years, we had to be into the science long before that to create the math to plot it. And deal with it. We created the first star charts. We created star charts of the heavens before most people were born on any other planets, on any other continents. So I need to be real clear. We were doing agriculture. We were smelting iron. See, one of the things you don't know about ancient Kush, that it was the first world smelting of iron industry in the world. And so those people who smelted iron were called Shimsu Haru, followers of Haru. And they were the blacksmiths. And we don't get a chance to talk about this. In Dr. Van Sertiver's books, Blacks in Science, he talks about an iron smelting machine approximately in the area of Kenya, Tanzania, that was smelting iron at temperatures where you can create steel, which wasn't created for Europeans until about 150, 200 years ago. We were doing it before or parallel to ancient Kemet. Come on. You, I'm going to show you some slides and some pictures of some stones that are almost as hard as diamond, diorite, that's perfectly carved. And they told you that the ancient Egyptians only had copper and tin tools. You can't, you need diamond cutters to cut this. So I'm trying to tell you, ancient Kemet started out almost at its height. It started out where America won't reach into another 500 to 1,000 years. That's how dynamic we are. And ancient Kemet began to decline each generation. Uh, one of my former teachers, uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard, broke down that we have to redefine our story. And so he broke it down to the first golden age, the second golden age, the third golden age, and the fourth golden age. And so dynasties were created uh, by our uh, European Caucasians during the Greek era, when Manetho was explaining our story to the Greeks. They broke everything up into family groups, so a dynasty is just a family group, okay? And uh, so it's not 10 years, like a decade or a century, like, you know, it's just, it could be eight, a dynasty could be eight years, a dynasty could be 100 years, a dynasty could be 200 years. It's that family rule, okay? So those are fictitious. They have nothing to do with ancient Kemet. Teach. So I need to make that clear. They have nothing to do. Uh, Akhenaten didn't know he was the 15th Nasu of the 18th dynasty. <laughs> okay, I need to make that clear. All right? So it's clear. Uh, what we have is the reunification of ancient Kemet 
approximately the date around 4240 ST, which is equal to the year 1, uh, no, 4240 BCE. 4240 BCE is equal to the year 1 ST, Semitown. That's the beginning if you are darting, uh, charting things from the civilization of ancient Kemet. But year one is the reunification of Kemet because that's the golden, so that's the first golden age in the modern era. But we can see heirlooms, heirlooms of other golden ages that came before. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, Taneta uh, Anu, who was a African ruler that ruled about 7500 BCE. And this is still 3,000 years before Kemet to let you know we were still ruling this golden ages but they don't have the records as they still unearth things. They're, they're going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole, you know, to see exactly just how old we are, or just how old our civilization, but they can't tell you all of this because the great question comes up is where were they? <laughs> okay. Right, you know, so they have to begin to talk about, well, were the Germans here? Were the French here? Were the British here? No! Not even on the planet. <laughs> and so, therefore, they're not going to put a lot of that information out. They might just say it's pre-dynastic. Like some of these bowls that were carved out of die right, there's a 9.0 on the hardness scale. Go back to the a golden age that preceded the last great flood. And I need to tell people, you need to study topography and geography if you want to even have an inkling of understanding history. I know today they don't even teach geography anymore. They throw it in with social studies. And that's to keep you ignorant. They don't want you to know anything about the planet Earth. You are the planet Earth. You are the essence of this planet. You are a carbon-based unit based on copper and iron. That's in your blood. European Caucasians are ammonia-based people. And you will know that if you ever got caught in the elevator with them. Okay. So now, I want to drop some things down. My divine brother Kabbalah talked about language. Some of y'all will get that in the morning. Right. Uh, <laughs> talk about language. How a language is the expression of a culture. Your culture is not to teach you just to survive, but it teaches you how to flourish. So when you out of your culture, you are out of your living mind. And it's very dangerous when somebody else defines your thought pattern. Mm -hmm. Dr. Amos Wilson used to tell us that our colonizer has given us their desires. Mm, take your time. So even the most Afrocentric of us mm -hmm. are recovering addicts of white male domination. Mm. Now you know if you're an alcoholic and you haven't had a drink in 10 years, you're still a what? Alcoholic. You're just a recovering alcoholic and haven't drank. I'm saying that anybody in this room, if you've been educated by Europeans, been indoctrinated in any of their uh, religious institutions, if you've been today, if you are a movie addict, a television addict, radio addict, if you are in love with English, if you, and, 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 if, and if this is the only language you know, then you're an addict of white male domination. Put it on. You might be at a suicidal state. You might be responsible for the destruction of your family and everybody around you. Call it how you see it. And you're afraid to destroy your enemy because you're so much like your enemy, you're afraid to destroy yourself. It's what it is. And that's where we are. And so we have to change our paradigm. Change the way we look at things. Think about it. Even your definition of success is defined by your enemy. Your parents told you, get a good what? Job. You don't want a job. You'll be just over broke your whole life. And whose education are you getting? You can't get a good education in these universities. And I know, I, make, I was in them, I got two PhDs and three masters. And what I'm teaching you today, none of it came from their institutions. It came from outside studies and books and, 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 and traveling. 
Brothers and sisters, your best education is to go to the source. Go to the source. So hopefully some of y'all will come with us on May 1st to Boston to look in some of our heirlooms that are locked up in lockdown. Right? Some of y'all will travel to Kemet with us and travel to other places in Africa. But before you travel, you got to get your spatial perspective correct. Get it correct. Not your orientation. If somebody's getting ready to orientate you, they get ready to bamboozle you. Uh -oh. mm. So when you go to your job and they say you got to go to orientation, you get ready to get bamboozled. <laughs> <laughs> you go to a new school, you got to go to orientation, you get ready to get bamboozled. <laughs> okay? You need spa proper spatial perspective. So now let me run this on you real quick. Brother Kabul gave you some uh, pictures of the earth, pictures of the Africa. I'm going to change the world just a little bit. Going to change. Peterson projection is good, but it's not good enough. Not good enough. If you buy the book and Peterson projection, inside of that same book, he has a map like this. And he says, maybe the Australians are not wrong. Maybe they're not down under. Maybe we're upside down. But he can't sell this to the schools or he'll be broke. So he doesn't sell this, he just lets you know that this is probably the proper spatial perspective of the world. See, he's trying to make money, he has to send his kids to school, okay? But this is a proper spatial, so this is how the Africans left the continent, so you begin to see. So, up here I drew Africa, so no, I didn't draw it upside down, you've been upside down. <laughs> The Hopi River, which they call the Nile, does not flow up north. It flows down north. Europe is not above Africa, like they've been telling you your whole life. It's below Africa. <coughs> the whole continent, Africa is the only continent between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, with the equator almost dividing it directly in half. No other continent has that. That means that you're a tropical and subtropical people. And it doesn't matter that you were born in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. Within your veins, your DNA, you are still a tropical and subtropical person. So you should be eating like that. Your stomach culture is still that. Right? right so I need to just make sure that clear. This word, mahet, means north, but it also means down. This word, the word uh, suit, suit, or sutin, or suti, or rashi, means south, but it also means up. This word, amenti, means west, but it also means right. This word, yabit, means east, but it also means left. We had this plotted before the Europeans knew there was direct directions. Come on. Before the Asiatics came out of their caves and were civilized by us. And so we set up directions. And in order for your west to be on the right side, you have to be facing like this, facing up to the land of where your ancestors come from. But the Kaaba showed you that in this region, in Central Africa, is the origins of where all of us come from. And from there we migrated to the continents. So you need to be real clear on our migration. And we stayed, when we migrated into Asia and into Australia, we stayed along the coast here. And so all the people along the coast here are people that have melanin. And all out, if you've ever been to Papua New Guinea, you would think you were in the Congo. Okay. Same culture, everything, just a different language. Go to Australia, you would still think you're in East Africa or Madagascar. Same people. In Madagascar, there are also people with uh, black skin, with sandy blonde red hair. Just like that. But look where, look where Australia is and look where Madagascar. They're on the same parallel. Same meridian. Y'all you, you, understand what's going on? There's a science here that our ancestors laid down. So not only did they plot the stars, they plotted the earth, the grids ran right through where the pyramids are. Sacred grids. There are three major points we call mountains of the moon. Kilimanjaro means mountain of the moon in Kiswahili. 
Mount Wanzuri is Mountain of the Moon in one of the languages in Uganda. And Mount Choka is Mountain of the Moon in Ethiopia. All of them feed into the Nile, which was in ancient time was called Hapi. Not happy, I know you're happy for the information, but it was happy, okay? So, uh, a twisted rope, flat, which also symbolizes your DNA. I'm gonna really get into this Madhu Nature if y'all give me a minute, because this is your classical language. If you think about it, the Madhu Nature was ancient before the first Greek got to Greece. So you know Greek can't be your classical language. So you have to be really clear. We are the original inhabitants of the area they call Greece. That used to be all water and, and canals, and we drained the land and started civilization as a colony there. And the Wazungu coming out of the rainforest got tired of eating each other, and they began to migrate around us. And then they became the first ones with Macedonia and then into Egypt. I mean, excuse me, into the land we call Greek today. Okay. Um, so, this is the word Hopi. The twisted flax stands to your DNA. So our lifespan is connected to the Hopi River. There is the hand. This is a receiving information, receiving knowledge, receiving life. There is the mat in which everything rests. If you know in Africa, you, you sleep on the mat, you eat on the mat, you rest on the mat, you have conference on the mat. And when it gets deep, you roll up your mat and take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the canal. The canal, myrrh. And even the same word for love is myrrh. But this canal, you, if you don't have no water, you ain't got no love. Look where there's no water. There's no love. Okay. And so they built canals to go out in to make sure that the love was every place they were. And then you see the three waves of energy, which is also the word for water, moon. And then happy, uh, there's a little hem uh, uh, homophrodite at the end. It's a man, beard, he has a breast, he's pregnant. He has a phallus, he got it all. <laughs> what is trying to show you that it can give life by itself. Just very nature harnesses life. Okay, so Hopi, this is our lifeline. It goes from Central Africa. It's over 4,160 miles long, the longest river in the world. That's not an accident. So we have to understand this lifeline. It's a cultural highway. Not only did the information come from inf inside of Africa, traveling down the Hopi River, the culture flowed that way, the language flowed that way, and trade. So it became a cultural highway, a com economic, commercial highway, and all of that. And trade took place in Africa, all the way to South Africa, in for tens, for literally hundreds of thousands of years before we left the continent. But when we left the continent, brothers and sisters, we were intact already. We set up the first dynasty in China, the Shang dynasty, actually the first two dynasties mm -hmm. in China. We taught them the language of reading. That's why their writing is down like ours, goes from right to left and top down, just like ours. Right. But like Brother Cobb was talking about, they got words in there that's not indicative to their culture. And so somebody came in and helped them set this up, took their language and stuff. They, Every word that re makes reference to astrology, astronomy, or the sky is an African word. Come on. You need to be clear about that. Very Look clear. at I'm, I'm what, and a lot of places all along here are imitations of actually what's going on here that's left in this world. Because you have to understand, at the last flood, all of this area went under. Africa is a plateau, the whole continent. The whole continent is a plateau. And so when Europe was totally submerged with water, or well, ice first and then water, Africa was still a valuable place. This is why they don't want you to know geography. But how many people saw the movie 2012? When the water finally receded and the rest of the world was destroyed, where were they at? Africa. Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this information is there. Uh, a lot of people, my more brothers, I'm a more, a lot of people, you know, no, civilization was here in North America first. No, I need to tell you, during the Ice Age, North America all the way to, to Florida was under ice. Where there was a flourishing civilization here, this was under ice. People don't know geography. Some of the brothers is like, no, when the continents moved, 
You know, we moved with it like they were surfing the continents as they was moving. No. When the continents moved, <laughs> there was no people here. All right, so I need to be real clear about that. They talk about, what, 65 million years ago was the last disaster. They got footprints and stuff like that of human beings older than that. But we won't go that deep yet. Go on and go that deep. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, now that we got our spatial perspective correct, you're not getting orientated here. You got your proper spatial perspective together. And you'll understand. In the Hopi River, we buried our dead on the western bank of the Nile where the sun sets. Okay? The sun rose on the east and sets in the west. We face most of our temples orientated like this or south in the direction of our ancestors. Okay? Not north. So you need to be very, very clear about this. So now that we got our spatial perspective right, we have a little direction of what's going on in the interior. I want to talk about some of these places. Ancient Kemet could not come into existence without places like this first. This is called, let me erase some of this so that you can see what's going on. Take your time. This first one is called Ta Seti. Ta Seti is one of the ancient names of Kush or Kash or what you call Sudan in present day. It means the land of the bow. We were the greatest archers in the world. How many people saw the movie Hero? Right, with Jet Li and all of them, right? You remember the archers and the bow? They took that from ancient Kush. The Chinese wasn't that deep with the arrow until we introduced it to them. So that was a scene coming out of ancient Kush where your arrow, when we attacked our opponent, and there were so many archers that the sky turned black. Okay, so I need you to clearly understand. Taseti, another name for ancient Kush. We also call that area Kash. I know today we use Kush, that's just a European veneration. If you learn the Madhu Nature, it's Kash. And that's why you'll see Kashai, Kashata, uh, Kushata, you know, all those are venerations of Kash. So Kush is a modern rendition of the ancient name Kash. Okay. When you see mountains at the end, it just meant that this was a foreign land outside of ancient Kemet. So when ancient, I'm writing it the way the ancient Kemet de U wrote the name of these countries. When they wrote their name, they probably wouldn't have had foreign mountains there. Okay. But if you understand the Hopi Valley, everything outside of Kemet, you got to go to the mountains. And so that's why when they talk about foreign countries, this is a determinative. That means this is outside of the borders of Kemet. So. Taseti Kash. Also, they call it Tanahesi. Tanahesi, the land of the Hesi bird, the guinea fowl. Okay. Um, where the Nechanit is, who is the archer. Okay, I'm going to go into some of the Nechanit in a minute. This is the, one of the most affectionate names of Kemet, and it's written like this Kemet, the black community. This is the determinative for community, city, or town. Not the black land, like the European Egypt. See, the European Egyptologists didn't even want you to know it meant black anything. But then we start reading the Madhu Nature, and they would say, oh, okay, it's out the, yeah, yeah, it's out the box. Okay, all right, y'all got the black part down. But it's black land, because the Nile overflow will leave everything black. So I had never went to Egypt at the time, so I said, okay, that, that sounds pretty good, fertile land, black land. But then I, I start doing my reading, and the people were called the Kometa U, the black people. I said, did the Nile overflow on them too? <laughs> no, this black means something else. This is talking about melanin. All right. All right. Dr. Ben liked to use this. This is one of their most affectionate names. Ta Mary. It means the beloved land. That's the affection they have for the land. The beloved land. And it was righteous all year round. This is the symbol for year. And so their community was beloved all year round. Mm -hmm. mm. They got a stake by that name. Okay, all right. Then. And this is called. This is the third name of ancient Kemet. So Kemet had three major names now. The other one is Sima Tawi, the united two lands. This is the heart with the trachea veins so the oxygen can get in there because if there's no oxygen going to the heart, that's all folks. All right? So that's unity, shows unity here. So Sima Tawi, the united two lands. So that's what ancient Kemet, this is the mother, the parents of ancient Kemet. And now this is Kemet. So this is why it's so important for you. This land, this is three dots there represent the, uh, the uh, mineral carbon. Carbon-based land. When the 
ancient Kemet to Ul talk about eternity, they do something like this. Watch this. That's one of the ways they write eternity, right? As long as energy exists within your DNA and the light of Ra shines, you shall exist. Mm. Right. This is why they don't want you to know your language. Yes. Come on and break it down. Okay? They also make forever and eternity like this. The cobra symbolizing your spine, your kundalini. As long as there's energy in your mind, you should be able to nourish yourself on the land. As long as the land exists, you will have nourishment, you will have energy, then you shall exist. You see how important this language is. So it speaks to us, it talks about who we are and how we are to flourish off of Ra and the land. Okay, so you need to stand. There's three major domains on this planet. Each planet differs within the solar system. You have the mineral domain, which is based upon carbon, which is black. You have the plant, the plant domain, which is based on chlorophyll, which is green. And then you have the animal domain, which is based on melanin, which is black. So only black and green are sources of life. That's why Asar, we, we picked it green and called the great black. Chlorophyll is to plants as melanin is to human beings, as carbon is to the land. All right, so hopefully that will resonate on you. All right. Deal, Infidis. Okay, so again, this importance of dumping into the Madhu Netcha. And you notice when we wrote the family, the black family, we have the child, the woman, and the man. Not two brothers. Well, my two sisters up together. Okay. That's representing eternity. Okay, all right. So we're jumping in here. All right. So is everybody comfortable with what I got up there? Do you understand what's going on? Do you understand why it's so important for us to understand the Madhu Detra? Now, ancient Kemet, most of us are mesmerized by the, the pictures, the gold, the jewelry, and all those things. But what's really so dynamic about Kemet is the mathematics. It's their ability to understand so above, so below. Even a town, these districts in ancient Kemet were written like, uh, like everybody got this down. You got African. You understand that you've been on your head your whole life. Okay, uh, I can move it forward. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, they moved into the modern era. Okay, all right. Um, I wanted people to know that, for example, This word, pet, means heaven. Heaven. This is like the skyline of the earth. And the creator rest and is nourished through the cosmos. Heaven. Sky. The districts in ancient Kemet, there were 42, were called Sapet. This is pet, and this is Sapet. Or if in the plural, sapetu or sa put. This means to cause to be like heaven. Mm. So every district was trying to imitate a cosmological phenomenon that existed in the sky. Which means that you already, before you had Kemet, before you broke the 42 districts down, you already had to plot the sky. You already understood the zoomorphic energy in the sky representing certain energies. So, in ancient Kemet, every sepet to cause like had to have a zoomorphic image in the sky. Like your school had to have a mascot. Every state has to have a flag. So, every sepet had a flag, had a zoomorphic energy, it had a bird, a stone, a crystal, a oil, and so today each state in the United States, because you had 50, 
three of the 56 people who signed a Declaration of Independence were all Freemasons. They were studying this. So every state got a flag, they got a flower, they got a bird. They, they didn't get that from Europe. That's all Africa. Right? So I need you to clearly understand that, where that phenomenon comes from. We took this really serious. As we plotted the heavens, we took that information and duplicated it on Earth. All right? So, Madhu Lecture. Why is this so divine? Why is it should be our classical anthem? It's divine words of the Creator. Madhu. Represent words. But what kind of words? This is a walking stick of an elder. So it's just not any words. It's wise words of an elder. A wise words of an elder who's connected to divinity. And so that was the spoken language and the written language. Um, I'm going to pass this around. This is so-called how they were supposed to um, break the code of how to read the Badu Netra. This is called the Rosetta Stone. This is a duplicate of the Rosetta Stone. I know we talked about it, but uh, like Brother Kaba, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm a touchy-feely guy. You know, I want you to touch it, feel it. You just don't sit on it. Okay, pass that, pass that around. So you can see the three different types of languages that help. What they didn't tell you is that Rosetta, that Champollion, best friend, had taught him Coptic. And Coptic is the last version of the Madhu Netcha. They didn't tell you that. My sister had a question over there. What? Well, it's divine words, but I was letting you know that the words represent words of an elder. So it's divine words of our elders expressed through the Creator. Mostly, we're going to have a question and answer period, you know, so uh, here we go. So, Netcha. Now, some of our brothers who don't speak the language or regurgitating what the Europeans say, so they break this down and they just use NTR. And they say Netcha. But I want you to know, in the old period, the first golden age, and in the second golden age, they used the word nature, and they spelt it like this. So that's why we have to know the glyphs. This word is T-C-H. So this is N. T-C-H. R. The nature. It's where the word nature comes from. If you put your vowels in, you get the word nature. What does nature mean to you? Huh? Come on, give me some definitions of nature. Life. Air. Life. Air. 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 Energy. Energy. Okay. So that's the way we look at the creator. It was divine, a divine nature. That's everything. Don't substitute this word for God. All of the Egyptologists and even our own African scholars just substitute nature for God. God is a Gothic word and it doesn't mean this. Because when I say the nature, I'm talking about the heartbeat, the beat in between the heart, water, air cosmos, that which cannot be seen, that which is still coming into being. Uh, my shoes. <laughs> yeah, the nature is all that exists. There's nothing outside of the nature. I don't think when you're in church, I don't think they kind of say God is like that. <laughs> you know, God ain't no bug. You know, they're not thinking that, but you know, no, we're thinking that, oh no, that bug, God is expressed in that bug. And therefore, I don't need to be smashing it. Just pick it up and put it outside. It was probably there before you were. Okay, all right. Nature, everything is divine. And so therefore, we look at nature differently. Everybody who came to ancient Kush or Kemet in Africa and said, these are the most divine spiritual people we have ever seen. In fact, they're fanatical about it. We were only fanatical about it because they were absent of it. What's being fanatical about giving homage and life to all living beings? How many of y'all in your biology class or something had organic and inorganic? Like some things had life and some things didn't. That don't even make no sense. Everything has life. Energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed from one state to another. Only the creator creates. All we do is reorganize the nature's creation. Mm, break it down. Do y'all understand that? Yes. Don't let them bamboozle you there. <laughs> you know, in a class called chemistry. Kim, the black science. Right. How many people understood that when they got in their chemistry class that you were studying the black science? 
Nobody. Okay, that means you've been bamboozled. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, are we clear on this word, this language? Madu Netcher, what it means, and why we need to understand the language, because it went from there to Netcher. See, the Egyptologists will put a, a line under the T, and that means that's T C H, right? Tetch. But after a while, the line just vanished, and people just said Netcher. And now people, and then people add an S on here talking about the netters. I don't know what they talking about. Okay, when you want to make it plural, it becomes the netteru. Now, I need to stay here because here we go. The gods and goddesses of Egypt. You want to do your work? No, brothers and sisters. No gods and goddesses of Egypt. The divine principles and laws of ancient kings. Each one of y'all. See, once you know, you got a responsibility. Before you go in, everybody take a sniff. <laughs> go in. Oh. Once you know, you have a responsibility. Uh, can y'all continue passing it down? <laughs> <laughs> Don't take Somebody can't get the sniff. They, they, they're missing the oil. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay, the presenter's done. So, let me just take a minute now and go through the next room since we are right there. The divine principles and laws. And people, everybody in this room, I don't care if you're a Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, you haven't figured it out yet. The divine principles and laws don't care. Everybody in here is familiar with gravity? Do you think gravity cares if you like it or not? Do you think gravity cares who you are, whether it's going to respond to you? No, gravity gets us all. It's a principle. It's a law. It's set up by the divine creator. And it acts on all of us unless you become creator-like. And only when you become creator-like can you mind melt with that energy and alter its state. That's what alchemy and stuff is all about. Transferring the energy and the vibration because everything in the universe is energy. So that means the only way you can divide a law or a principle is you become the law or principle and you redefine it within your own paradigm. Some of y'all will get that in the morning. <laughs> okay, now. Haru <laughs> Maketi. How many of y'all want to call this something else? Come on, level with me. You want to call it the what? The Sphinx. Sphinx. Right, come on out with it. The Sphinx, a mythological creature that comes from Europe that has wings that will kill you if you don't know the riddle. Has nothing to do with Haru Maketi. To master your animal domain, which is like the lion, to rise to your highest spiritual nature, which is the high priest. Okay. So now, if your son said, I want to be a Sphinx, or if he said, I want to be Haru M. Aketi, mm -hmm. which one would you say, Jim? Right, he says, Dad or Mom, I want to protect our family and our culture from sunrise to sunset, and I want to be like Haru, the champion of the people. You see, that's why we can't let other people define our stuff. Haru Im Aketi. Let me hear y'all say it. Haru Im Aketi. All right. I can feel the vibration go up. All right. Washington, D.C. How many people been there? You seen the Washington Monument? Some of y'all think it came from Washington. No. This is imitation. This is the Tekken. How many people saw our video, the Tekken? All right, I'd like to see that uh, after all this. Yeah, give yourself something. Support yourself. <laughs> okay. The second is of our spiritual energy representing the masculine phallic symbol, which has to interconnect with the female symbol in order to create life. But it's symbolic of our resurrection, our rebirth, our renewal. There were usually two of these set on both sides of all the temples in Kemet to represent the father and the son, Asar and Aset. The ruling king was Haru. When he died, he became Asar, to resurrect, to be reborn, to live over and over and over again. And we bear witness because we are their children. And we, they live through us. Let me make this statement, y'all. You are the ancestors. The ancestors is not somebody you just pour libation to. The ancestors is not somebody you go visit in a cemetery. Their DNA is passed through your veins. You are a culmination of all these people I was talking about going back tens of thousands of hundreds of years. They exist through you. Yes. So when you say their names, it resonates in your veins. It gives you a responsibility. And we have four ways we ancestor that energy. Number one, we speak their names. 
El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Omawali. When you speak their name, Marcus, Messiah, God. When you speak their names, they resonate within you. Okay? That gives you your energy, your responsibility. When you say Harriet Tugman, you're leading the Underground Railroad. Even if it's just your neighborhood, help somebody. What? Harriet said she could have helped hundreds of thousands more if we only knew we were slaves. If you only knew you was upside down, you'd be able to get yourself straight. <laughs> so it's your job to help to be like Harriet Tubman. So when you mention these names, so that's the first way. You speak their name. Number two, you deify their complete works. These are their complete works. They laid down the principles, the laws of the universe. They charted the stars. They set up the zodiac, the zoomorphic energy of the sky that exists within us. The combination of all the animals in the world exists within you. You ever seen a fetus going through its various stages? It goes through the, 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 what, amphib uh, the water stage, the amphibian stage, to the mammal stage. You are a combination of all the animals that exist on earth. They exist within you, but you're taking it to a higher conscious because you can act like the creator. You can take the thought and create it to anything you want. So we are nature-like. So when I open up and say we are divine spiritual beings, having a divine human experience, look at yourself as a divine being. How many people have seen this? You bump into something and go, oh, I'm so clumsy. You know, no, that's called negative self-talk. That permeates in your water. Your body is 75% water. Water holds more memory than any molecule on the planet Earth. So when you speak to your water, your water reflects that energy back. So that's why positive affirmation is so powerful because when you speak to yourself, that resonates in your water and your water says, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you don't get in the mirror talking about, oh, it's a bad hair day. I can't get it together. No. Then you think your hair bad? It's really going to get funky. Okay? No. Speak what you want. Don't talk about how broke you are. Talk about how your funds is getting ready to come in. That's right. They're a little low now. You got that disease called my funds is low. Okay. But, but, you, but you, you're getting ready. To, it's coming. You, it's flowing. Can you feel it, brother? Yeah. It's coming in. All right. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. It's coming. Speak what you want. That's why in all the sacred books it says, in the beginning was the what? Word. And the word was what? With God. With God. And the word was With God. Where do you think they got that from? Amen. 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 Okay, all right. <laughs> Let me go here. Sabek. They don't usually tell you about this. Come on and break them down. Sabek is the comedic word for time. The Sabek has 60 teeth, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 vertebrae going down his back, 60 minutes in an hour. <laughs> this goes on. Sabek is amphibious, but yet it's mammal. It lays eggs like a bird, but yet it's a mammal It has to lay its eggs outside of the water. And so when the Nile was getting ready to overflow, Sebek knew just how high the Nile would flow, plant his eggs at that level, and the people knew where to start moving their things to. Because that's how in tune Sebek was with the flow of the Nile and, and the energy that exists within the universe. We have that ability, we just kind of lost ours. Okay? But Sabek, symbolic of time. Sabek is another energy of, of Satesh. Okay? Sabek, the crocodile, will only bother you if you are confused and don't know what you're doing. <laughs> when the Nile, when the Hopi River was low, Hopi, the Sabek would come on land looking for some food. Now, if the Hopi River is low, you know you ain't supposed to be hanging down there, taking a nap on the beach. <laughs> then you was going to be a snack. Okay? And then you want to be mad at Sabek. He's doing what he was doing. You are not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Controller of time. You can't control time. Control your energy within time. Because time is only a concept of consciousness. Our ancestors were able to travel through time because they bent it based upon their consciousness. So you didn't take you a thousand years to go to another planet. You can get there like that. It's talking about we come from Sabet, uh, Spadet. If you were on a spaceship like we have today, it would be a thousand years to get there. They got there like that because they bit time, because time is only relevant to your level of consciousness.
this brother, this happens to be Usir Ma'at Ra, Setepin Ra, the person they call Ramses II. He's wearing a compressed crown, the blue crown. If you see little curls, little knots up on top of here, it represents a hairstyle. In my book, I showed about it. The Watusi, the Zulu, all of them wore this hairstyle. During the second golden age, when it came to an end, and we got invaded by the Hyksos, the Asiatic foreigners, who ruled Kemet for maybe a hundred plus years. When they were kicked out, the brothers from the south, up south, where's my map? You erased it. No, no, oh, I sure did. That's all right. I got a backup. <laughs> the brothers from, you see, we have to manufacture our own stuff. That just goes in here. I don't depend upon the Wazulu information. We got our own stuff because we are the creators of all this stuff. We have to go back and producing our own books, producing our own tapes, producing our own works, producing our own houses. Most of our houses are backwards and set up for Wazungu. We need to change it. Why do you want energy from Khan Ed when you got Ra, the sun? Mm. Right. Let me say that again. Why do you plug into Khan Ed when you got Ra, the sun? You see how we're depending upon our former enslavers? We need to come together. And we need to make it happen. Ross still waiting on us. <coughs> All right, now. So, our brothers who came from up south wore this hairstyle as they kicked the enemy, the Hyksos, butt all the way back into Asia. The ancient Kemet U was so, uh, so thankful and so appreciative of this that they developed a crown, a war crown, it's called the war crown, that whenever they went into battle, and it didn't have to be physical battle, it could be a spiritual battle. Whenever they were having large meetings to organize the community, the Masu put this crown on. So this is from the third golden age on. That's the so-called 18th dynasty. So from that dynasty on is the only time you see this crown. So if you see somebody with this crown, they try to say that was the old period or the first period. Eh, wrong, okay? You know your story. Third golden age on, 18th <coughs> dynasty on, okay? I said... I have to put a set with a sar. We have sar the great black. A set. Let me write her name down so that y'all see this connection between the two. This is the right angle that the masons and everybody get all excited about. Okay. Uh, you stand on your square, brother, you know, okay. And in here, in, <laughs> there would be a, the Simatawi, and they would have the a lotus plant and a papyrus plant tied with a knot showing the unification of upper and lower Kemet, okay. And it's on the square. This is the throne. This is how you write Aset's name. Aset. She is the throne maker. No ruler in Kemet can sit on the throne until they come through her, through the woman. And so brothers, when you think you rule in the house, you rule through your woman. Okay, she is the throne. When they want to write Asar's name, he got the throne there, right? But, His name, Wasar or Asar, is like that because he is the I behind the throne. Er also is an action verb that means to make, to do, to bring things, to make things happen. And so he takes the energy from the feminine energy and makes it happen. He is the I that protects the throne. That's why he has the cobra and the uraeus on top of his head. That represents upper and lower Kemet, the two ladies. The two women, that's called Nepti. So you have Nepti. You have uh, on this side, you have the vulture. And on this side, you have the cobra. Wajet and Nekabet. All right? And so when the king has these two symbols on his crown, that represents that he is a protector of the two energies. And you'll see this on all of the Nesut. Usually the woman only has the cobra on her head, but everybody is seeing this. You've seen the bust uh, on my table. I got a bust of, uh, I guess you see the cobra. That represents the Nepti. The two ladies, women, 
in ancient Kemet, they constantly showed you just how important you are, how powerful you were, that we exist through you. Our very nature is to protect you and to keep you because you are a divine essence of all life on this planet. So brothers, can y'all give these sisters a hand right now? Show them an appreciation for them. Stand up and give them a standing ovation. Stand up, brothers. You are the reason why we do what we do. We ain't doing this for the other brother, like Alexander and his Greek army. <laughs> now you know Alexander was gay, even though he was undefeated in battle. He would always put, he would divide the lovers up and have them flank from both sides. And so the lovers, and they would put the enemy in between. So the lovers was fighting to get through the enemy to get to their lover on the other side. So they were tenacious warriors. Okay, all right, so we're not going there. All right. So, you understand this feminine nature. So, Asar became the I, the maker, the doer, Aset. She is the feminine energy, the mut, the womb. On top of her head, she has the cow, because she was also depicted as the great cow, like at Het Haru. That's what was up here. Het Haru, Aset, never had, sometimes they would be all intertwined because they represent the mut, the mother energy. And the mother energy would be depicted by the vulture. Now I know I was teaching them to do nature class, and the sister said, oh, so y'all the great falcon, and we got to be a buzzer. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, sister, no, you went real left, you were real European on me. <laughs> you got to alter your state of consciousness. See, you only came like that because you was upside down. What you should have asked me was, well, what does this buzzer this represent? And you will realize that it's one of the greatest nurturing mothers on the universe. Right. It will eat off its own leg, chew it up, and feed it to its children when there's no food. Right. Mm. It, it, the, the female vulture doesn't need a male to get pregnant. It faces the eastern wind and the wind in pregnancy. Right. Mm. Shoo. We call it shoo. The cosmic the cosmic winds of the universe. Not only that, she has such a powerful stomach acid, she can devour a, a caucus that has maggots and everything on it that would make any other animal sick. She can digest it and then regurgitate it and feed it to a young and it would be nurturing food. So what she did, she took all the caucuses and all the things that would cause disease and cleaned it up. And so, come on, brothers and sisters, you know, like, when stuff get real funky, you call the woman up in there. You know, you got the little baby until something happened, then go back to mommy. <laughs> all right? And she's the one that cleans up the filth, you know, and everything, you know. Uh, you throw up, you know, like, oh, I'm out of here, you know. All right. So mut, that's that mothering energy. And we can go on and on and on. So that's why you have to know these things in nature. Because I'm sure, just raise your hand if you had a negative idea of the vulture. Raise your hand. Look at that. That's because you're upside down, on your head, taking your information from your enemy. Mm. Are you starting to see why we need to change our paradigm? 2012 is here. You're going to die with your enemy unless you change. You understand where we're coming from? Yeah. Brother Kaba made it real clear that the Japanese had a chance to change at the end of World War II. Mm. They were the leading industry of solar energy. But they chose nuclear energy instead. Mm. They wanted to follow the Europeans. They wanted to out-European the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And now they've almost dug their own grave. Wow. Okay, y'all? All right, y'all see what I'm talking about. The Chinese people are only able to get themselves together when they chased their enemy out and had a cultural revolution. Mm. When they opened up them doors, they knew who they were. Say it again, I don't think that was. <laughs> a cultural revolution. Malcolm made it clean. Made it real clear. Okay? He showed a picture of a a um, 10 year old girl blowing her father's brains out because he was an Uncle Tom Chinaman. Mm. When that girl grew up to be a full grown woman, there were almost no more Toms in China. Mm. Think about it in America. Toms is on the, the cover of Life magazine. Tom, Toms is on the cover of that comic book, Ebony and Jet. Toms is, Toms, is all of, Toms is everywhere. You actually look up the Toms. 
Son, I want you to grow up and be like that town. I mean, uh, Dr. So and so. Okay? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Times get Nobel Peace Prizes when there's no peace. <laughs> now, if the wolf gives the sheep a peace prize, and the wolf is fat and the sheep is skinny, there's a problem there. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't see it. And we like, yes, son. Yeah, daughter, you grow up and you might get one of those too. No, you don't want one of those. <laughs> okay, all right, let's jump back in here. Right. <laughs> the first family, the first trinity, Asar, Arset, and Haru. I hope I don't, I know we got some Jesus folks up in here. They sneak in everywhere. <laughs> well, I got some, some born again Kometa U people in here. You know, like Ray Higgins, he was, the first time he heard the word Haru in a meeting, he wanted to fight. No, oh, Jesus, they got nothing to do with no Haru. You know, he wanted to beat them. He's supposed to be a Christian minister. He's ready to fight, beat somebody up, because they confuse Jesus with Haru. But just give him the tape. Look at this. Read this book, 18 Crucified Saviors Before J.C. And they all did exactly the same thing that J.C. did prior to him. So J.C. just had a, he had a map, right? If you want that energy, somebody followed that energy that was already laid out, and all he did was do everything everybody else did. Okay. You had the Father, the Son, and Haru. The Son is Haru. The word hero comes from the word Haru, because Haru is just H-R-U. If I put an E there, and the O and the O sound the same, the word hero, which means champion of the people. Haru fights against Isfe. That's right. Haru is your consciousness. A lot of the Nasupiti, the rulers, would have the falcon on the back of their head because they represent higher consciousness. Higher consciousness. Okay? And so that means that you got to be in battle every day. I love this example of ancient Kemet. It's not like you can mess up all week and go to church on Sunday and it's okay or do Sabbath on Saturday, and, and you'd be forgiven for your sins, or just confess to Father. Father, I raped a whole lot of people and done some messed up stuff this week, but I know you're going to forgive me. No. Haru says, you have to be a champion every day. How would you feel, let's say it's 90 degrees today, that means Rob was really, really cooking, right? Rob was out there, y'all was just, you know, oh, yeah. And then Ross said, well, look, I was so good today, I think I'm just not going to come out for a couple of days. <laughs> Who would happen? Yeah. If Ra act like Negroes, <laughs> oh, 2012 would have been here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right? So Ra is consistent every single day. The universe is consistent every single day. The cosmos is consistent every single day. Energy is flowing every second of every single day. Yes. Negroes take breaks every single day. <laughs> People, <laughs> you got to kill the Negro inside of you. You got to resurrect. You got to be reborn. You got to be Haru. I want to hear some born again Haru energy up in here. Okay? <laughs> That's what you need every day, and I don't care how bad you were yesterday. I don't care if you gave a smoking lecture, you did a whole bunch of stuff, and so today you're just gonna get high and hang out. No! <laughs> <laughs> you gotta come back today and you gotta be on it also. You know? Dear. So you will never see him from DC at Smitty's Bar having barbecue and hanging out with the boys, talking stuff. <laughs> Cause then it will contradict everything that we're about. Do y'all understand? You gotta be Haru all the time. You gotta be a champion of the people. Wait, if you tell your children, just do what I say, not what I do, what's gonna happen? We already know what's gonna happen. What's happening now? Prance down. Right, okay. All right. So, Haru is the champion of the people. He's the champion because he does battle with Isfet. Isfet is our energy that wants to pull you out of balance, wants to pull you out of harmony. You say, okay, bean sprouts, chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. I had bean sprouts yesterday. So. <laughs> Set, right? that, you lost. Listen, the ancient Kometa U makes it real clear. Everything is either life-giving or life-threatening. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Life-giving or life-threatening. When you get ready to eat, life-giving, life-threatening. 
You have a mate. Life giving, life threatening. I'm not talking about how hot she is or how tough and buff he is. Life giving or life threatening. You get ready to go out that evening. Is it a life giving experience or life threatening experience? If you're at Smitty's bar having barbecue with the boys with a cold one, I think that's a life threatening situation. Okay. So even if you don't even if you don't do what everybody around you was doing, you get caught. In. Listen, I was one of the priests that they brought in for the uh, vigilance for the World Trade Center, for all those blacks who died in the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I made sure, as we talked about their souls being resurrected, and, is that when you eat with swine, you die with swine. Yes. If you wallow in the mud, you can do it. If you're playing in the funk, you got to get funky. Brothers and sisters, you need to get the European mindset out of your consciousness. You need to get them off your back, your clothes. You need to get them out of your diet. You need to get them out of your bed. You need to get them out of your total consciousness so that you can go back to being the creators that you rise waiting on you, ready to give you all the energy you need. All the energy you need. I tell you, I don't have no bad days. Every day is a great, magnificent day. Because you determine how dynamic you're going to be. You determine how much money you want to make. You determine where you want to go. I wanted to go to Kemet. 1981, I went with Dr. Ben. You know, I gave him this thesis, this paper and everything. He said, okay, listen, I'll let you go for half price, but you're going to be my aim. I said, oh, bet. I'm down with that. What you want me to do? <laughs> That was 1981. I've been to Kemet over 25 times and I've never paid again. Mm. Right. You will. You don't need no money. You need your mind. Yes, yes, yes. Some of you think you never left anything in Africa. No, you left your mind there. <laughs> you need to reconnect. Reconnect. Reconnect mm. to the whole continent. Reconnect. Yes, we are the indigenous people here, but you need to go where they came from here. You need to keep that going. Um, so Haru, the father, the son, the, the mother, the father, and the son, the Holy Trinity. And so you can see where the Christian, now let me just say this, Mary, I mean, I said other name is Mary, the beloved one. That's why Jesus' mother had to be Mary. Mary means the beloved one. So she had the same mother that Jesus had because he's the imitation of her. At 30, he went to, got to go, well, at 13, he went to do his father's work. Haru went to go train with his uncle, Haru Or, in the temples at 13. At 30, he came back to do battle with Seth. Jesus came back to do his, his teaching at 30. The 12 disciples are the 12 zodiac. It had nothing to do with no people. The book is a book of astrology and astronomy. How many people look at their horoscope every day or every other day? Come on, raise your hand. It's not a horoscope. Horror is the word for Haru. Scope is what you look at, so it's Haru's vision. You're checking out Haru's vision. We created this so that we can see where we were going before we got there. And when you get a, a view from the height, you get sky view. So your Haru vision, your horoscope, was a vision of your future or where you've been. So that you, if it was good, you can get there again. If it wasn't, you know how not to go there. Okay. And it kind of gave you a peek into where you were headed. It was a, what is it called? Uh, what's that system, the PG, uh, the, 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 the car, they help you get there? What is that? GPS. Yeah. GP, what is it? Global Position GPS. The GPS system. But Haru, your consciousness, you got that inside. Your cell phone is imitating what you were able to do by sending energy out there. Okay. So we got the Holy Trinity now. Let me come over here. Set at the daughter of Ra. The daughter of Ra, Sekhmet. I see a couple of Sekhmet people hiding over there. Okay, all right. <laughs> when things were going wrong and people got confused, Ra sent his daughter down to straighten stuff up. So Sekhmet went down, and Sekhmet's job was only to mess with folks who weren't together. But Sekhmet, Sekhmet found so many people that weren't together, she started devouring everybody. <laughs> So the natural room came up and said, Rob, you got to do something about Sekhmet. She's just doing everybody in. She just fell in love with blood. She's just drinking blood. She's just killing everybody. 
<laughs> None of the other natural roots said, oh no, I ain't messing with that system. And y'all know, brothers, I don't care how bad a brother is, you ain't seen a real fight until you see some sisters fight. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> brothers be just trying to be outdo each other. You know, we be trying to get off pretty quick. Knock them out and say, yeah. You know, I'm like, sisters be trying to kill each other. Ah! Ah! Pull their hair out. Ah! You can get a hold of it. Ah! Kill them. <laughs> I ain't never seen a brothers fight like that. <laughs> so, segment was doing everybody in. So none of the other natural rules said, no, uh-uh, I ain't touching that. Uh-uh, bro, you gotta do, you send Jahuti down there. So Jahuti, articulate mind, thought, articulate writing, articulate speech, articulate action. So Jahuti came and obsessed the situation. He said, oh, okay. She just fell in love with blood. So I'm just going to use some black magic on him. Jahuti turned the Nile Hopi River red. And told Sekhmet, you don't have to kill nobody else. Just go to the Nile and have a drink. And Sekhmet saw all the blood. Oh, wow, just dove in the... But it was wine. <laughs> she got all drunk. And when she got almost ready to pass out, Haru, I mean Jehuti, just put a spell on her and said, when you awaken, you will be Baset. Wow. You will no longer be a ferocious lioness. You will be a gentle, beautiful, purring black girl. And you will adorn people and you will dance and make music and you will just be loved. And so today, sisters, if you get a little setetious, segmented, Get some red wine. Call it a day. <laughs> Put on something black. It just gets sexy for your man. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Jehuti, again, represent articulate thought. Jehuti is not some god outside. Remember, Jehuti exists inside of your mind. Everybody has Jehuti in there. When you're using reasoning, when you're using consciousness, that's your Jehuti thought. Don't give up your, the word thought comes from thought. Jehuti, to think. Some of us are not doing that. Okay, so when you're thinking, that's just, you're doing your Jehuti. Jehuti is the tongue of Ptah. The creative spark of the universe. The creative energy. The architect of the universe. The engineer of life. Jehuti is his tongue. Ra, the creative energy that exists and permeates all things on this planet. Jehuti is his voice. Amun, the unseen energy that permeates every cell and every entity of life throughout the cosmos is the mind. Jehuti is his mind. So Jehuti, that means that all that is exists within you. And that's why to educate really means to bring out. The Western world, they stuffing stuff in that you memorizing for tests. No, it's to bring out. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. The reason why you're going like, yeah, is because you, you're resonating on that. That was inside of you. And all I did was bring it to the surface. That's Jehuti. And so he is in there. So y'all got to use your Jehuti. Don't be afraid to put these on your altar and in your house. You ain't bringing some gods and stuff in there. You're bringing divine principles that's going to help you on your mission. And each of these principles can resonate with a Haru vision. They can resonate on your organs that plays the music for your temple. They can resonate on you getting your program together. Maybe you need a little segment in your life. Maybe you need, maybe you've been procrastinating, so you need your booty on your altar, looking you in your face every day, so you can do what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. And, and if they don't get it, you get it for them and put the jahuti out there. <laughs> Anpu. A lot of us wear black at funerals. You know, you should probably be wearing white to reflect and come back so that you can get the energy. There are European saw that Enpu, or Anpu, was black and, and all his priests wore the black as they were preparing the body. So, because they didn't bury their dead. You understand that, right? Yeah. The ancient Asiatics and the, and the ancient Europeans didn't bury their dead. When you're in a the cave, ain't no place to bury them. When, when Uncle Raheem died, you just put him over on the side. 
Yeah. Would you run out of bowls? You could just get his head and kind of wash it out and you'd be drinking out of his skull. Oh, yeah. Right, you know, okay. And that's why they got all these horror pictures to back of the living dead and all that. Because they were living with the dead people. They were in the cave with them. Look, if you're locked in an ice glacier that's a mile high and you can't get out, only certain people can. That means that some people never saw the sun in their whole lifetime. So you're in a cave, you never saw the sun. Uncle Raheem died, you just put him over on the side. He break a mortar set up, he stand up, Ooh, he come out of here. Okay? So that's in your subconscious. That's in your subconscious mind. So you got people walking around, you know, half eaten up. Come on, Frankenstein, all that. That comes out of the European mind. We created theater, y'all, and we didn't have no horror. That's from the Greek ethic. They created horror. They got the, the fan face and, the, and, the, and the, the sad one and the happy face, you know. No, we just had some happy faces. <laughs> you know, we had some mystery and stuff like that, but you know, we were trying to make it real, but the horror stuff, no, we didn't. No, that, that wasn't our cup of tea. Okay, all right, so I need you to understand that. So, Anpu was just preparer of the body for the next journey. He has a whole bunch of different names, you know. The one who was the head of the mountain. The one who was leader of the way. The guardian, the transformer, you know, all those different names. Each of the natural rules has many different nicknames. And in my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healers, I break down all the natural rules. I give you the various different names and their energy. You know, and, and I break down little concepts like, for example, when we say that every living king was Shemsu Haru, mm -hmm. now you say, come on, bro. The king is a bird. <laughs> a pigeon. What's up with that? There's a person who doesn't understand nature. I said, no, man. The hawk, the hawk, the falcon, and the eagle, they're in the same fin. They fly higher than any bird. They got an extra layer of skin that goes over their eye, and they can see directly in the sun. No other creature can do that. They have no rivalry in the sky. Their vision is so keen, they can spot a mouse under a leaf from a mile, hovering a mile in the sky. And they're 99% accurate. Air pilots are imitating falcons. They can calculate the speed in the bin of light as they, a fish is going this way. He's going this way, 70 miles an hour. Dives down, turns in under the water, and comes up 98 times, 99% of the time with the fish. People, they're still trying to calculate that. And so now, if you understand this, this power that the falcon, the eagle has, he has no rivalry in the sky. He perches and has his nest on the highest mountain or the highest tree. Now, so if you understand that because you live in the country and you understand that, and the brother came up to you and said, I'm a mighty falcon. You'd be like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> you, especially if you've been acting like a chicken. You had chicken for breakfast, you know, yeah, you got this, you know. You ain't trying to get away because there ain't no place to go. Ain't no place to hide. Mm. So that's the way the rulers in ancient kingdom, they were Shimsu Haru. They were mighty falcons. Mm -hmm. See, you have to understand nature. Like, watch this, and I, I teach that everything in nature has at least three levels. You see, this is where the magic is. Watch this. Come on, magical chemist. This is Kepper. Now I know I'm teaching this in classes. This is, oh, no, we're going to study bugs now. No sister. no, sister, rise up, rise up. Alternate, you upside down, turn around. <laughs> Kepper, a dumb beetle. So we understand the first level is the concrete, the physical, what it is. What does the dumb beetle do? The dumb beetle recycles the filth. In the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania, hundreds of uh, elephants. Giraffes, zebras, water buffalo, all out grazing. So if you're grazing, if something goes in, it has to what? Come out. So you know it has the potentiality to get very funky. Y'all bear with it. Can I get an amen on that? Amen, amen. amen for the funk. Okay, now, Kepra cleans up all of the funk. Our elephant turd is like this big. When it comes down, within two hours, you can't find it. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of these dung beetles verge on them. They dig a hole in the ground. That's called irrigation. Then they roll the dung into a 
perfect spear. No other creature on the planet can do that. They lay their eggs inside of it and then bury the inside of the ground. So when they put the dung in the ground, that's called what? Fertilization. Irrigation, fertilization. So you see what a Serengeti, the largest grassland in the world is the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. There are more animals there per square mile than any place else on the planet Earth. The home of Kevin. In the south. Up south. Y'all understand? Y'all with me? Take another sniff, y'all. Ah, uh, we going in. <laughs> okay, that's the physical level. That's the physical level. So, we understand that it recycles. It takes filth and cleans it up. In the morning, when you step out in the Tanzania plane, and take fresh air. No dung. Right now, they got to they gotta import dung beetles to Texas because all the cows is pooping all over every place. The underground water is all polluted and, and, and it's messing up the whole water shift, the whole water shed and everything like that because they messed up the ecology because they don't know nothing about nature. They killed all of the natural pesticides and in insects with their uh, uh, pesticides and fertilizers. Okay. So now, we have a concrete level. Number two is what does it do? It recycles, it comes into being in every day. Because if they took a day off of not collecting the poop, y'all understand what would happen, right? Thousand zebra, thousand wildebeest, thousand and some elephants. All you need is a day off. <laughs> y'all got the picture? Everybody got, you got the picture. See, the visualization is happening here. You got the picture. So he's coming into being and he's coming forth every day. Y'all mm -hmm. remember what it was like in New York when the garbage people took a, uh, went on, on strike, right? It got real funky, literally, in New York, right? Okay, so that's the way nature would be. So nature doesn't take no days off. Only fools and Negroes. Okay, so two coming into being, coming forth. That's the second level. The third level is the spiritual level. Now you get the Egyptology books on hieroglyphics, and they don't even deal with this because they don't understand that. Their pineal clam is like a raisin. It's all dried up. Your pineal clam is like a grape. It's all juicy and stuff, a little big black grape, and you, you're seeing visions and colors on many dimensions, and they don't even know what you're talking about. You be like Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, what, you, what you listening to? They think you got some earplugs in. You ain't got no earplugs in. You just vibing, you know. Okay? Because you are everywhere and nowhere at the same time. They can't even understand that. They can't, they can't even phantom that. They outside of that. The average European Caucasian, by the time they're 13 going through puberty, their pineal gland is calcified. Go check me out. So the spiritual level is that Kepra means that spiritually I'm coming into evolving into my mission. And so when Kepra is placed like, watch here, when a person dies, they put a big Kepra and they put gold around it. This is with the nobility. Yeah, if you were a poor farmer, you didn't get the gold. But you can still get the kepper. Okay. Gold intensifies. If we deal with metals, uh, copper conducts electricity. Mm -hmm. Silver metabolizes and keeps things in harmony, vibrating on the pitch it's supposed to be. And gold intensifies. So that's why the thugs is all gold down, because it intensifies your thugism. So you ain't a real thug, you got 20 pieces of gold around your neck, you a real thug now. Okay, because it's going to intensify what you're doing. Okay, they don't want no silver, they don't want to be metabolized, they don't want to be harmonizing and stuff like that. You know? you know? And they definitely ain't putting no copper on, you know, all right, because, you know. So, but that's what you need to be into, you have to understand. Gold intensifies, silver metabolizes and keeps harmonic energy, like my art. And then copper boosts your electric charge, your electrical charge. If you add magnetic to it and iron, then that also helps your flow of energy. You just got to watch out, make sure you got a placemaker. Okay. All right. So, three levels. The concrete, 
the abstract, but what it does, and then the spiritual level. So every word in the Madhu Netra is done like that. To come forth, don't mean just to come towards me. To come forth means to come with the flow of energy. Flow the way the universe is flowing. That doesn't mean that. Look, watch this here. And cheer. Cheer is cheer. I don't care if you got three PhDs. It don't get no deeper than that. Y'all understand that? In ancient Kemet, the Nastu, got as deep as you are. Not only was it a sacred divine stool that everyone needs to sit, but the king rules through this stool. It's like the Ashanti people, it's who sits on the throne. Well, the Nasut will say, I am the Nasut of the Nasu. I am ruler of the sacred stools. Come on. If somebody told you they was the king of the, uh, the chair, you'd be trying to get away from it. Yeah, okay. You got that. Because the chair has a chair age. This language is limited. An ancient Kemet that had many divine levels to it. So everything was on at least three levels. There would be more levels, but that you only learn that through initiation. Okay? So uh, that's what I'm... And this is how I got into crystallology here, y'all. The crystals we get outside. If you look at here, look. Lapis lazuli. Carnelian. Turquoise. The gold, the silver. Blue lace agate. Emerald. All of these are the stones and they are consistent with representing the energies in your body. Now, let's just uh, come into Kemet. All this, I was just setting up Kemet. Uh, now I just want to talk about what is it is in ancient Kemet. First of all, y'all have been told the wrong thing again. Every time y'all talk about kings and queens, let me say this. In Kemet, in the Hopi Valley, we had no kings and queens. That's a concept outside of our paradigm. The ruler in ancient Kemet was called the Nasut. And then when he ruled both lands, <coughs> He was called the Nasut Biti. Not Pharaoh. Pharaoh is some Greek word. It comes from the word Per'ah. Brother Kaba broke down how the word Egypt was a misnomer of Hekapata. Well, Pharaoh comes from the word Per'ah, the great house. You don't call the ruler. Obama is the president of the United States. When he comes in, you don't go, oh, they go to the White House. No, you say that's President Obama, Barack Obama. Okay? You don't call him the White House. No one called the ruler in ancient Kemet the per the, the the Great House. You call them by their name. They were the Nasut Bitti. Every ruler had at least five names. He had a birthing name. He had a Haru name. He had a golden Haru name. Then he had a Nasut Bitti name. And then he had a Sa-Ra name. sa Rock. So these two names will be put inside of a shin. A shin is an elliptical orbit that shows that the ruler ruled every place that the sun shone. That the sun was shining and it rose and set. How many people call this a cartouche? That's French. That means a cartridge, a bullet. Because that's what it looked like when the French saw it. Don't call those sacred symbols a cartouche, a French name. It's a shin. S-H-N. Or if you can put a little E in there if you can't pronounce it. A shin. So, the Sara and the Nasubiti will be placed inside of a shin. The Sara is the son of the sun. Everybody who went to the temples in ancient Kemet, regarded, that's why the, all the, the early Hebrews, the early Christians, they got that halo around them. That meant they went to the temples in ancient Kemet. 
It had nothing to do with no theological stuff. No, it meant that they studied and came at the sacred temples and they were sons and daughters of the sun. Take that mysticism out of it. Okay, <coughs> sons and daughters of the sun. So the, the ruler recognized that one of his names is he was the son of the sun. His other name is Nasut Betty. Remember we talked about the cobra and the vulture, Nekabet and Wajet? Well, Nasut the south, Bitti, the north. The north is where the grapes and the wine and all of that was. That's where the bee was. The suit is the south. Remember we talked about when I drew the plant, this was a symbol for south. The suit plant. Sometimes they can leave this off and they just call them the nasut. N-S-W-T. The nasut. It was, so that meant, but you European Egyptologists don't want you to know that. Because the Nasut means the ruler, the ruling energy from the south, where the sledge and the soup plant goes. So if the south is in the interior of Africa, the ruler of Kemet is saying he is the ruler from the south, where the divine energy of nourishment comes from, then you know the Nasut can't be no white people coming out of the interior of Africa. And they got white pharaohs. They, every time they make a picture, they got some white pharaohs sitting up there, somebody with no melanin. That couldn't happen if, you, but if he's called the pharaoh, that could be anybody. But if you say, I'm the Nasut, I'm the divine energy from the south where the nurture, creativity, and rulership comes from. That's a whole nother picture. So that's why they don't want you to know Nasut Bitti. And Bitti, we are the first people to take and cultivate honey and use it as a commerce to, do, uh, to export it all around the world. Okay? And that's from the Bitti. And we actually had barges and ships that were only for the bee to develop the honey. And we could control their diet on the ships. And so they, if it was supposed to be barley honey, it was only barley. That was supposed to be maple honey, it was only maple. You know, it was like that. So the first cultivation of honey. And we teach in a comedic journal where there's 100 remedies that honey is used for. Even right now, most amputees would be saved if they would just wash it and place honey over the wound. Honey acts as an a, a automatic antiseptic and a antibiotic, and it will heal where all their medicine cannot heal. So most amputees with gangrene, all you had to do was wash it and put honey on it and no disease and no gangrene can set in. Okay? But we, we teach, when you learn that Madhu Netcha, 100 ways that honey can be used to help heal and maintain harmony in the body. So you see the names of the rulers had power, there was a whole, there were layers y'all, they went real deep. I'm only giving, giving you the surface here. As you take a Madhu Netcha class, we go in much deeper. Okay, so I'm just trying to give you. So the Nasut Bitti, and this came about at f approximately 4240 when Nama, Namas reunited upper and lower chain. Okay. Um, we encourage you, there's three major, well, mix that you can get into when you're, uh, after you learn the Madhu Netcher. And first is the pyramid text. The pyramid text is the oldest spiritual beings, uh, sp uh, works in terms, in written form. But it talks about a time that goes to that 7,500 and 10,000 years ago. The pyramid text is talking about that time up until the time where we're just beginning to do pyramids. So they had information of astronomy when Kemet first started. So that's why Kemet looked like within 300 years or 200 years, it went from a little simple pottery to the space age, okay? Because they already had libraries with all this information housed in it. So the pyramid text talks about astrological space travel and understanding uh, energies from outside of our uh, solar system in the pyramid text. So the pyramid text is one. Then you want to do the coffin text. The pyramid text is the first golden age. The second golden age, which they would call the middle period, is the coffin text. And that was the information written on all of the coffins and in the walls, the funeral text that was on the walls inside of the sacred uh, burial grounds. Okay, and then the third text is this one, the Pert M. Haru, which they call the Book of the Dead. Uh, they call it the Book of the Dead because they found these writings with the dead people. 
but they didn't understand that people weren't dead, okay? That it was a book of life, had a book of coming forth by light. It was a book how to be immortal. It was a book how to overcome its fed even in the afterlife. Because remember, if energy cannot be destroyed or created, then you are your physical body goes back to nature, but your soul and your spirit goes on. And they call the soul Ba and the spirit Ka. All right? Okay. Uh, that's why you have something, the Kabbalah, it, even among the, the, the Muslims, okay? The spirit and the soul connected to love, the Creator, okay? And so those are books you also want to want uh, in the fourth golden age. You want to take the Shabaka text, and the uh, Shabaka stone and all that is part of the Shabaka text. So you have the pyramid text, the coffin text, the Perkim Haru, and the Shabaka text. And then there's a couple of Sabiats uh, teachings of uh, Ptaho Tech and some people like that that you want to get into. But you want to read our version. I encourage these books because I don't have to read what they said. I just go in, they wrote it, they, they blew up the picture so big, you just go in and read the text. Don't go by what the Wazungu said. Remember, he doesn't understand the whole spiritual thing and everything that we did was spiritual. So they're going to give you, the words might be right, but the meaning totally wrong in the way they translate it. So 90% of the things they have translated have to be redone by us, brothers and sisters. We hold the magic of ancient Kemet. We are magical Kemet. Kemet is waiting for us. All those writings on the wall are still waiting for us to translate it. They're still waiting for us to come into our right consciousness so that we can go back and get the messages they, they left us. Why, when the Europeans came in, they destroyed everything, but they left the Madu Netra on the wall? Think about it. And get rid of the people. They get rid of all the rituals. Destroyed, made you couldn't, you couldn't do the spiritual system anymore. But they didn't destroy the Madu Netra on the walls. They couldn't read it. But they tear up stuff they can't read. <laughs> They, that's what they do. They tear stuff up. They, they masses that tear stuff up. But they didn't touch the Madhu Netchit. It's still there on all the sacred temples for 4,000 years. You can go to the libraries and the museums and the, they still got papyri still preserved. Ancestors knew. And they left these keys for us. Brothers and sisters, you remember all the pictures you saw of how they built the pyramids, carrying these two and a half ton, 15 ton blocks up a ground. And pyramids wasn't built like that. All the real initiates know. I can't tell you right now, I'll tell you I can kill you. Okay, but anyhow, anyway, if you come to initiation, come to me do next class, we show you how that do that. You remember early in the lecture, we talked about that energy, principles, you were governed by them, unless you became the principle. When you became the principle and you were the energy, then only at that point you can alter the energy. Well, blocks were willed and made and put right into place. Mm -hmm. They can't even find the place where some of the places were quarried because it wasn't. Mm -hmm. There's something called the funeral text. The funeral text talks about how Imhotep had to go into Kush and to consult Kanun the great molder, and understand all the minerals and gems so that he can manufacture and build temples that will last forever. Mm. And so what it tells us that Imhotep, who's being classified as the father of modern architecture, the first person building in blocks, that's not correct. That's the way the Europeans are feeding it to you. But if Imhotep went to consult the libraries that was thousands of years old, who was doing that writing? So he had to go to ancient Kush. But they're trying to tell you that Kush is an offshoot of Kemet. It was a colony of Kemet, and then when Kemet fell, they just kind of imitated with Kemet. Well, nobody else built temples like that but the Kushites. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people was biting off of ancient Kemet. They weren't able to do what they were doing in Kemet, but the Kushites could. The Kushites were even doing this in, this in the common era. During the time of Christ, so-called Christ, the Kushite civilization was still flourishing. Mm -hmm. So you need to examine 
this writing that's on the wall. You need to examine this energy. In those <coughs> texts, they took, watch this here. In the, the Sahu, which they call Orion, on Orion's belt, he has a sword. And at the end of the sword, it's a real bright star. And the ancient Kemet in the pyramid text said, we come from there. Some of us come from there, and some of us come from Spadet. So now, only in the 20th century, European astronomers have found out that that's not a star at the end of his sword. It's a nebula. A nebula is the, like an incubator, a cluster of energy that creates stars. It's the oven that creates stars, that creates all the elements in the universe. And, the and they knew in the pyramid text 6,000 years ago that their solar system comes from there. Do you see how deep this is going to get? Mm -hmm. And that's just the beginning. So that means that writers of the pyramid text understood that at Orion's, or that, that, that that was a nebula that created the star that our sun comes from. <clears throat> this gets really deep, y'all. Mm -hmm. It's really important. See, the magic in Kemet is waiting on you. You want to hear about some hocus pocus. Mm -hmm. Magical Kemet is Jehuti locked in your mind, upside down with a head and trying to get out. Jehuti's tired of speaking English. <laughs> and, and French and Spanish. German. Jehuti don't want to. Jehuti wants you to go. I'm in Ra na suit netra. I think Ra never know. They in new Uncle Neb. Neb Atu Amra Amantu Saru. That's what they want to hear. You are divine beings vibrating on a level that they can't even understand. That's magical chemistry. Magical chemistry is when you wake up and go back and claim what is yours. Claim what is yours. The reason why some of the Arabs can destroy some of those heirlooms in ancient Kemet when they were going through the resurrection, because that's not their ancestors. Mm -hmm. They just got there yesterday. Yeah. They pimping our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hold it. Think about it. They come from an Islamic society, and they consider this idols and worshiping and blasphemy. And they got you scared of your own stuff. You'd be like, oh no, you're trying to find your cross. You know, as you some of you, if you bring some of these in your house, your parents are like, did, did I go wrong, baby? <laughs> when you start tapping back into the real nature, when you tap into the real source, golden Kevin is vibrating in your heart, it's in your blood, your blood is liquid crystals. Study the crystals. They will tell you, they align yourself with every organ in the body. And don't go for the seven chakra thing. What Dr. Leader Africa tells us, we got at least 12 major centers. You got hundreds of uh, chakra centers, or we call it Shechem Shin Ra. So you even got to leave their language alone. Sanskrit, we taught them. Come home, y'all. Kevin is waiting for you. The writing on the wall wasn't there for nothing. Those temples are still there. Listen, you go to Jerusalem. And they say, okay, well, uh, this is where we think Christ went in, over here. Because it ain't there no more. That's right. You go to Assyria. Uh, we believe the Tower of Babylon must have been in this hole somewhere around here. You go to, you go to Kevin and it's still there. Yes. Yes. The pyramids are still there. That's right. Haru Emaketi is still there. That's what right. they're talking about, they, now even the Europeans is messed up with the dating. <laughs> They tried to say that Ka F. Ra, the son of Khufu, the builder of the Step Pyramid, made Haru M. Aketi in the temple next to him. But then they found an inventory text that said that Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid, built a small mortuary temple next to Haru M. Aketi in a temple that was already there before the so called builder of the temple. Now, if this was there before the Great Pyramid, when was it built? is facing with the on horizon where Leo comes up in the horizon. Leo came up in the horizon 10,000 BCE. Mm. So this was built 10,000 BCE. But now somebody says, but wait a minute, 10,500 BCE, that's when the last ice age and there was water every place. 
and it shows erosion all around it from great rains and water. So this was built before then. <laughs> oh, snap. Well, wait a minute. When is the next age of Leo? The next age of Leo is a whole procession of the cycle, which is 26,000 years. So the next cycle is 36,000 BCE. If you go to the temple of Seti, <coughs> the Osarian temple is right next to him. Inside of the temple of Seti, Seti has a list of all the Nasukbiti from the time of Norma on one side, and then on the other side, which they don't show you, it has all the natural rule. It has three sets of rulers. It has the divine natural rule rulers who were human beings in their right consciousness who were operating like gods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have that ability. That's what happens to you when you're in your right mind. They're going to talk about, oh man, there was a, a, a group of gods that emerged from America in the 21st century. Okay? <laughs> that would be y'all. Okay, so the ancient Kemeta U talk about they had ancestors that walked on this earth who were godlike, natural like. They were defined principles and laws because they were the laws. They were the principles. And we were just imitating them. They got a whole list of them. Then they got the Shimsu Haru, the followers of Haru before Narmer. They got a whole row of them. And then he talks about his immediate ancestors, and that comes up to approximately 36,000 years. That's in the temple of Seti. So if they say 36,000 years, and Haru and Maketi goes back almost 36,000 years. Are y'all starting to see the picture? Oh yeah. Take another sniff. We're gonna get ready to calm down. Okay, go. we're gonna move down. We're gonna start the one. I'm trying to show y'all that you are magical, Kimmy. And the reason why Africans in America, more so than any other Africans on the continent or in the diaspora, are tapped into this magical information because that's who you are. At the Library of Congress, they know who you are. If you go to Washington, D.C., you will see these faces all around the Library of Congress. But if you go to the east side, you see five faces, all African, saying that civilization began with the African melanated person. It's right there in Washington, D.C. And then they come all the way around and last on the scale is the blue-eyed blonde, who's the most recessive and the last of the human family. He's actually an adopted, adoptee of the human family. Uh, stepchild. <laughs> okay, all right? They put it right in front of you. And on the doors right there, they get consciousness which starts with Jehuti. That's in Washington, D.C. They get Jehuti right on the door. Then after that, they got Confucius and a whole lot of other people like that, but they start out with the lip and the tongue and the consciousness of the natural room. And so the people who built this country, who brought some of your ancestors here, understood this information. And they have become great using it. Yeah. How many of you have been to the, in Washington to the temple of, 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 um, of the York Temple and the Scottish Rites Temple? All inside of it is the natural room. They got Haru right up there. Every place you look is Haru. They got the falcons, they got the gems, the crystals, they got all of these things that are vibrating from ancient Kemet, not from Europe. And these are Europeans. They are vibrating off of our energy. Their sacred ceremonies and all their rites are stuff that they're getting out of the Perk in Peru, the pyramid text, the coffin text. They are taking that information because you see energy is not good or bad. Energy just is. You have the ability to do anything you want with it once you get it. That's why a martial artist, you know, in ancient times, you would have a martial artist who became this great master, right? And then he got tired of being broke, <laughs> right? And just went out and started taking stuff. And nobody could stop him. Oh, I'm getting back. Take some of that. <laughs> okay? And nobody could do nothing about it. And y'all were saying, oh man, he's evil. Some send a good guy after him. No, the good guy got destroyed too. Yeah. Okay? Because the only way evil can destroy good is evil. Good has to prepare itself for evil. And they meet in battle. You ain't gonna win just because you're good. You go to church every Sunday, and the other guy out cutting folks all, all during the week and robbing people all week, right? And then y'all meet on Saturday. What do you think gonna happen? <laughs> you get ready to get cut and beat up and get robbed. Okay, all right? You got to prepare yourself. Good and evil. Um, I, was, I won a national champion at, at uh, Madison Square Garden a couple of years ago, a couple of decades ago. <laughs> and um, 
I'm fighting this guy, Rodriguez. He's red, white, and blue outfit, the cover of Karate Illustrated, and he's doing Van Damme splits and all of this, you know. So we get to the finals. So I go in my corner and I meditate. Now my son is my biggest fan. He said, Dad, you gotta start warming up. This guy's bad. You know? I said, son, I got this. Mm, I'm no, Dad, you're gonna need more than I'm gonna. <laughs> this guy kid, he was like throwing kicks you know, all up to the ceiling, you know. You know, he said, Dad, you gotta break a sweat. I said, no, son, you don't understand this. When I go out there, it's not gonna be info DC. Mm. I'm going out with the Neturu. Mm. I'm going out with Shungo, Haru, Batawa. I got all of them with me. I got Shaka Zulu. I got all of them with me. That's who I'm bringing with me.